and welcome to the Cogito Design Channel, which is all about tabletop game design. Today's video features a famous designer who has been central to the development of the board game industry and was a massive inspiration for us in creating our recent legacy game, Solar 175. It's the one and only Rob Davio, the genius behind the legacy mechanism. Risk Legacy, Return to Dark Tower, Seafall, Mountains of Madness, Pandemic Legacy Season 0, 1 and 2, Cthulhu Death May Die, these are just a few of the games Rob has co-designed. So to put it simply, we are very honoured to have squeezed in an interview to absorb all this genius. For 14 years, Rob worked at Hasbro Games before launching his solo career as an independent game designer. Not only does he design games, but he also shares his expertise. He's been a professor of game design at Hampshire College and NYU, has been a speaker at dozens of conferences, has contributed towards various books on game design, not to mention the fact that he's the chief restoration officer at Restoration Games, where his goal is to bring the best out of print board games back to life. So without further ado, let's hear from Rob himself. Uh, the concept of a legacy game came about, uh, it's kind of a long story, I've told it before so I'll give the highlights here. It actually came out of a meeting about the game Clue, and we were brainstorming lots of things and I kind of made a joke about how, um, I don't know why these people keep getting invited to dinner because someone always gets murdered. It just gave me the idea of object permanence in games. And I've been a role playing gamer, my well not my whole life, since I was 10. And you know, you pick that up and it's the next session and comic books pick up where they left off and books and movies and board games always go back to start. So it gave me the idea of, is it possible for a board game to pick up where it left off? Um, and there's lots of things that we tried and lots of things that didn't work out and it didn't work out for Clue. I pitched it for Hasbro and, uh, or pitched it to when I was working there and it was just a bit too much out there. And then about six or nine months later, revisited for Risk and then Work my butt off to turn it into the um, the first legacy game, which was Risk Legacy. Um, the idea of object permanence and picking up where you left off was part of it from the beginning. And then what sort of came in through the development was the idea of uh, unlockable content that you don't get everything at the beginning. You're going to unlock rules and new stickers and new things. And this was really just as a way to control the permanent things because at the beginning people were just putting stickers down as fast as they got them and by game two or three they were all gone and then, you know no one was holding back and so i needed some way to sort of lock it off and say okay you have these things for these couple games then these things for these couple games and it was those sort of two pieces of permanence and unlockable content that became a legacy game all right question two Uh, well, it's big. It's complicated. I've heard people say um, it's not a real game, which cracks me up because I've published over 100 games. Maybe six or eight of them have been legacy games. And each one of them takes about as much time as two or three games. And that's if you're starting with a finished game such as Pandemic or Betrayal of House on the Hill. Uh, if you're starting with a brand new game, creating a legacy game is first you have to create a game. And then you have to make it a good game and then you have to make it so that it's simple enough to understand right away and fun, but then complex enough to add what are essentially expansions as you play the legacy game. And then you have to wrap it all up in a narrative. Then you have to think of how to explain everything and what happens if players drop in and what happens if players, you know, drop out. And the whole thing just takes quite a while. Uh, Matt and I did Pandemic Legacy Season 1 in about 13 months, and that's sort of like a speed record. By the time we got to the last one, Season 0, it was like two and a half years because we didn't want to duplicate ourselves. And it took a team of five or six people about 18 months to do Betray a Legacy. So they're they're quite big games. Um, and the trick is you have to know manufacturing because since you're hiding things, when people open the box, it looks like there's a lot less there than it's there, but the cost of manufacturing is quite high. So how do you let people know that they're gonna get great stuff, but hide it away and make that all affordable? And, I think the secret sauce for me at least was 
having worked at Hasbro for 10 years, I had a good sense of the manufacturing process and how games go from being just a, a prototype to a, uh, a final product. Yeah, of course people reject that. It's radical, it's strange, it's weird. I don't go around ripping my games up. I, I'm i not a sleever, I live somewhere. It sounded so like I was condemning it. No, I just don't like card sleeves. I don't like how they feel. And I don't mind if cards get worn a little bit. I don't mind if a game gets a little loved. If I play a game so much that the um, the cards get worn, it means a game I love and I'll, I'll buy a new one. But I'm also not collecting magic cards that are worth hundreds or thousands of dollars. Um, but yeah, I mean, you buy a game and the impression is you can play it as many times as you want and you can have it as long as you want. You could bequeath it to loved ones upon your passing. You could play it 10,000 times or you could play it not at all. And that's the choice of the person who buys it. And what a legacy game does is it, it takes some of that away from players. And that's, that's kind of violating it. I mean, not very softly. It's kind of intrusive, I guess is a better way to say it. Um... You know, I'm saying you can pay, play 12 times, and yes, now you have to throw this away. But, uh, you know, the destruction gets a lot of attention um, because I was doing it at the beginning for Risk, and Risk is a very macho sort of game. It's very like, ah, in your face and trash talk and these sorts of things. And so putting destruction made sense there. Oh, you wanted that? Let me rip it up in front of you. And it was sort of the mindset of the Risk brand team at the time. If you look from Pandemic Legacy 1 to 2 to 0, Matt and I get further and further away from the idea of destroy and you know eventually we just we don't care what you do with it it's just not part of this game you can put it in a little bag you can tuck it to the side it's just it's not it's not part of your story anymore um, some people like it it's very freeing you know you take such good care of most of your games and then here's a game which is like just just rip it up and there's something liberating about that but no I mean it's very radical and even now 10 12 years later after thinking about it I'm Absolutely shocked I thought about it and absolutely shocked that it came to market. Not at all. I love a strong narrative. I'm a role-playing person and if a game has a theme or a story, no matter how light, I'm personally much more invested in it. I've made very few games that don't have a story or a theme. Um, it's because of what I like, but there are thousands of games without a theme or a paste it on theme, they're quite lovely and quite popular. I hear this game Chess and Go, those seem to be kind of popular, stood the test of time. Uh, games don't have to be balanced, they don't have to be short, they don't have to be long, they don't have to be two player or one player, they just need to be fun for the people playing them I and that's different for everyone. Everyone likes different foods, different musics, different movies and different games. So I think we get caught up in what's required for a game to be a game and what things need to make a game a good game. and Sure, there's some consensus amongst people who play games a lot about generally what makes a good game, but there's a lot of the dissent within there as well. It's interesting. Um, yeah, five, seven years ago, I used to get emails all the time from publishers. So we turned this into a legacy game, or that into a legacy game, and. I did it for a few and some I did and then it just never came to market because the market changed and I don't know if you follow the news but we had a pandemic so we had a couple die along the way it's part of game design um no one's asking me as much these days I think the moment has kind of passed a little bit um I'm taking a break from them I'm keen to get back to them but right now I'm the chief creative for restoration games and we're doing these unmatched and dark tower and those have been fun i think any game that starts out fairly simple and you could see putting two to five expansions in it and has enough of a world for a story could be a legacy game but that's just the ones that excite me i think that there's games out there that are much more euro and abstract and don't focus as much on a story and some that maybe start out complex and don't get much more complex i i think the idea is you know, it's a campaign game with surprisable features that come out. I think people these days aren't focusing on the destruction as much. Like any other art form, it's going to evolve, and every person who does it is going to decide what it what it means to them. Um, personally, if I have ideas, I like to keep them to myself just because I want to surprise people if and when I ever make them. Um, there are a couple brands I'd like to work on. 
and there are some brands that I couldn't possibly imagine doing it. It just wouldn't be a fit, and that's fine. It's kind of the same that I've been saying for 10 years. The market's fairly saturated. Um, there's a lot of publishers. There's a lot of games. Just try to make your game stand out. But also decide what it means to be a game designer. I'm fortunate enough to do it uh, full time and make a living off of it. And it's a lot of work and I work weekends and I go to conventions and I record interviews. And if I don't feel like working on games, I still work on games. And when I go to play games with friends, I'm always bringing out a prototype because it's my job. So if you want to be a game designer, maybe you just want to make a game for your friend group. That's great. Maybe you want to make one game every couple years and make a couple thousand dollars off it, pay for a vacation. That's that's wonderful because when you don't feel like working on a game, you don't work on that game. If you don't have an idea, you don't have an idea. Um, I love being a game designer. Every time I've moved away to do something else, I, I come back to it. But, you know, whenever you do something full time, it becomes a job. And, you know, you just want to ask yourself, hey, I want to design games. It's like, who is it for? Is it for your friends? Is it for your family? Is it for your game group? Is it for a few thousand copies? Or do you want to do it full time and just set your goals and and try to go there um that's that's really about it and also no matter how much you do this the first time you put a prototype down that you've worked so hard and it doesn't work it, it just stinks and it's always deflating and i don't think that ever goes away well i finished a bunch of games early in the pandemic they all just, some of them, as I mentioned, kind of died out, but a few of them just all got dormant and it looks like they're all about to come out or be announced soon. There's a Stranger Things game that uh, I did for CMOD. There's a D&D &D game that I did for Wizards of the Coast. Uh, there's another thing that haven't really been announced. Two things that really haven't been announced. Um, but other than that, I've been working on restoration games. We did Return to Dark Tower. We've done Unmatched. Um, we're working on Omega Virus right now all sorts of various things that, that we're doing. And it's kind of fun. I've reached a point in my career where I'm, I'm doing games, but I'm also kind of leading a creative team and working as a businessman. And that's a fun change of pace for me. I've started working on a few things on the side outside of restoration, but it's nothing to, to talk about then. It'll probably take six months to two years before those really reach fruition. And um, it's just kind of fun. So I, thank you to all the people who bought my games and played them, I get emails from time to time, and it's uh, it's hard to say this without sounding facile, but it, it means a lot. Because I work on something, and then it goes to a publisher, and then it goes to people, and then it maybe I read a review. So people who take the time to to reach out and just say, hey, I liked your games, that's great. It's it's that feedback that you know gets me excited to work on a game if it's a snowy March morning, and I'd rather just be doing kind of anything else. So, um, it keeps it fun. So thank you very much. And thanks for having me on. Thanks so much, Rob, for squeezing us into your busy schedule to answer our interview questions. We really hope you enjoyed this interview and found it useful. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments section below. If you want to learn more about this fascinating legacy mechanism, then I've linked our video here and also in the comments below. If you're liking our channel, please like this video and subscribe to show your support. Last but not least, I want to give a massive thank you to our loyal patrons who help us create these videos. Thank you. See you next time. Bye.